Hey everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week, and to sharing some practical tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 19th, 2015. Let's jump right in with last week's Security Bites. Today's story is the CIA Director's Email Hack. This story comes from a New York Post article where they allege that a high school hacker has actually taken over the AOL account of the CIA director, John Brennan, as well as the Comcast account of the Homeland of Security Secretary, Jay Johnson. Now, what we know about this attack primarily comes from a Twitter handle, PHP Hacks. Apparently, the self-described American high school hacker who says he's not Muslim contacted the New York Post and shared 40-some documents that the attacker stole from the CIA director's uh, AOL email. It's kind of crazy to, to think that the CIA director is using AOL for his personal email unencrypted and that apparently he's uh, sending sensitive documents from his government account to this AOL address. In any case, the attacker says he was able to pull off this hack with good old-fashioned social engineering, calling AOL and getting the director's uh, password reset using these social engineering techniques. And that's probably what he did in the Comcast account too. And apparently some of the information in these 40 plus attached documents was pretty sensitive. It included things like Brennan's social security number and a number of other social security numbers. In any ways, what can we learn from this? Well, I think the number one takeaway is to think about all the ways our business lives coincide with our personal lives. You know, not even talking about all the personal devices that find their way into our networks. Think about how often you as an employee of your company might share work information with one of your private accounts. There's all kinds of security implications here. There's strong ties between consumer users and consumer accounts and the businesses and the organizations they work with. So how can you protect your organization from this? Well, it's actually pretty hard to do so without having lots of draconian security policies, but do know things like WatchGuard's firewalls have things like application control and HTTPS inspection. That means we can actually see when people are connecting to Gmail or any sort of web-based account. And if you have our DLP, we can even detect when documents are sent to these personal accounts as well. So you may want to consider using application control or DLP to start to monitor and see when your employees are actually sharing information with personal accounts. That said, you do want to allow employees some flexibility, so any sort of policies blocking these accounts may be kind of hard to do. Today's story is Oracle's critical patch update for October 2015. Oracle follows a quarterly patch cycle, and today they released a ton of security updates fixing many, many vulnerabilities in a widespread array of their products. Specifically, they fixed over 154 vulnerabilities in more products than I have time to name. Things like the Oracle database server, Oracle's MySQL product, Oracle C many other Oracle Enterprise products, and most important to many users out there, Oracle's version of Java. Now, I don't have time to list all these security updates or the products affected. I'll be sure to post links in the blog post associated with this video to Oracle's blog on this issue, as well as their big critical patch uh, advisory that details all the affected products. But long story short, many of these vulnerabilities in these products are very critical. For example, some of the vulnerabilities affecting the Oracle database server have a CVSS score of 10.0, which is the maximum severity. That means bad guys can leverage these flaws to easily take over the server. On top of that, some of the Java vulnerabilities also have a CVSS score of 10.0. And again, the Java vulnerabilities probably affect the most people, as many people have Java running on their computer. And a 10.0 or high severity Java flaw means that if a bad guy can just get you to visit a malicious website, they can leverage that kind of flaw to force code to run on your computer. Long story short, if you use any of these Oracle products, especially Java, you're going to want to go to Oracle's site and get the uh, proper patches to correspond with all these updates. Today's story is a malicious Chrome browser lookalike. This story comes from an article on PC Risk as well as some analysis on the Malwarebytes blog. Both these organizations found a piece of software which the industry calls a PUP. This stands for a Potentially Unwanted Program. These 
these are programs that aren't necessarily directly or, or for sure malware, but they're programs that might pop up unwanted advertisements or might uh, follow uh, bad privacy practices where they will monitor you. In either case, both these organizations found something they called the eFast browser. This is a browser that was created using Google's Chromium free open source browser, and it looks very much like your normal Chrome browser. However, this browser is definitely something you don't want. It's semi-malicious. It will actually pretend to look like Chrome and try to take over a Chrome installation if you have one. It actually associates itself with some of Windows's file and URI or URL associations. That means if you interact with certain files like HTML files or pictures, or if you go to a HTTP or FTP link, rather than uh, browsing with your normal Chrome browser, it's going to force this eFast browser to come up. The browser even aggressively tries to replace Chrome's shortcuts with its own shortcuts. Now on the surface, this will look just like Chrome. However, it does a lot of unwanted activities. It will do all kinds of advertising pop-ups, and it seems to follow your browsing practices and share that with the attackers. This means you could be redirected to sites you don't want to go to. Most of the time, it seems to just be doing clickjacking where it pops up unwanted advertisements, but this could easily be a malicious site as well. So long story short, you do not want the eFast browser. So how do you get this particular browser? Well, the people behind it actually pretend it's legitimate, and they actually package it with other free downloads. As you're downloading free software, you need to be very careful to pay attention to some of the things happening during the installation. Oftentimes, this free software tries to force additional software on you, and they do this to help pay for the free software. So two tips here. One, when you do download free software, be very careful where you download it from. You know, just downloading software from the internet can be dangerous. But two, even when you're downloading legitimate free software, pay attention to the installation process. If it's saying it wants to add some sort of browser plugin or some sort of new piece of software on top of what you, you downloaded yourself, be very careful when considering whether or not to allow that additional software. I personally don't recommend it. Today's story is Apple Patch Day. I'm traveling today, so I need to make the story very, very quick. But yesterday was Apple Patch Day. They released a whole bunch of security advisories. Long story short, they released security updates for OS X, iOS, Watch OS, Safari, iTunes, uh, Xcode, and also the EFI firmware that's on, running on Mac computers. So many, many updates in many of their products. If you use Apple products, you're probably using one of these, so you definitely want to go update as soon as you can. And by the way, when I say they released OS 10 updates, it's both for their server and desktop version, many different versions of OS 10. Some of these vulnerabilities fix pretty critical flaws, so long story short, if you have Apple products or if you're using Safari for Windows, be sure to get those updates. Today's story is a overblown Fitbit hacking story. Early in the week, a researcher named Axela Avril, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, released a teaser of a presentation she planned to give later in the week at a Luxembourg hacking uh, conference. In any case, the research pretty much had to do with hacking a Fitbit. Basically, she figured out how to intercept the Bluetooth uh, signal of a Fitbit device, and not only could she do things like change the steps on your Fitbit, bit, uh, monitor your connection and things like that, but she could also inject a little bit of code on the Fitbit, and the Fitbit would store that code and it would persistently actually broadcast it to any other device that the Fitbit connected to. Now, when the news first got a hint of this story, they quickly talked about how you could use this as a way for the Fitbit to infect a laptop with malware. Now, later in the week, her real presentation came out, and her presentation had some pretty good Fitbit hacking information. She showed how you could actually intercept the signal. She had all kinds of neat uses for a Fitbit, like using it for a random number generator, uh, using this hack to actually make blinky lights show up on your Fitbit, and potentially even using your Fitbit as a way to lock your laptop based on your proximity to your laptop. However, her main hack, the proof of concept video she released, where you actually put a little bit of information on the Fitbit that actually then shared that information with any device it connected to, the whole takeaway that that could infect your laptop or your, your Fitbit device with malware is totally overstated. Really what she could do is inject a 17-byte message that the Fitbit would then rebroadcast in its Bluetooth packets it sent out to other devices. Now this is an interesting 
interesting vector. That means you could put a little invisible message on a Fitbit. But in order for that little 17 bytes of, of data that the attacker could control to take over your laptop or load malware is a huge step. First of all, that 17 bytes, how does it force your laptop to do anything? One, there would have to be some vulnerability in the actual Fitbit application, or there'd have to be a vulnerability in your Bluetooth stack. And the vulnerability specifically would have to be triggered by parsing this specific 17 byte message. This researcher did not find any such vulnerability. So even though she can put a little bit of data on the Fitbit, she has no way to take advantage of that data. But for the sake of argument, let's say she did discover some vulnerability in the Fitbit app or the Bluetooth stack that could actually uh, be triggered by this little message. 17 bytes of data is not a lot of data to work with. Once you trigger some sort of memory vulnerability, you still need to have code that takes uh, advantage of the pointer and gets it to a certain place so that you have control of what the next code is. That takes a few bytes to do. Then you need to load some sort of payload or shell code. And 17 bytes is not a lot of, of information to do that. Now this particular researcher mentioned an old vulnerability, a crash bug that only took four bytes. But a crash bug is one thing, an actual code execution vulnerability takes much more room. You have to be able to inject shellcode. Long story short, even if you don't understand all this technical stuff I'm talking about, she never did find a vulnerability that would allow this injected code on the Fitbit to do anything to the device it was connecting to. And even if someone did find that vulnerability, there's really not enough room to do anything that bad. So really, all the news out there talking about how a Fitbit can actually push malware to your PC is totally overstated. Now, that said, we do need to consider Internet of Things devices like the Fitbit as a new vector of attack. The fact that she could only control 17 bytes in this case means this is not a real world example of that. But in the future, if someone can find a way to inject a bigger payload and find a way to take advantage of a flaw to use this device to push uh, code to other machines, that could be a threat. That is kind of why people are worried about the Internet of Things. So the whole idea of malware jumping from one type of device to another type of device is plausible. We've actually seen this in the mobile world. There is malware that infects a mobile device, but then tries to move to a traditional laptop when you plug it in. So anyways, this Fitbit research was well done. It is interesting, but any idea that you can actually use this to push malware to a PC or a mobile device from a Fitbit today is totally not true. Don't believe that. That's it for this week's video. I hope you found it useful. As always, please follow our blog, blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. Besides posting the video there, I have a link with a reference section that has all kinds of other stories I might not have had time to cover this week. As always, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. And finally, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want the videos as soon as they come out. Anyways, as always, thank you for watching. And here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.